Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, invites you to be the informed patient with the podcast that features experts from Central New York's only academic medical center. I'm your host, Amber Smith. Today, I'll be talking about a cardiac condition that can lead to heart failure but could be treatable if diagnosed early with cardiologist Cynthia Taub. Dr. Taub is professor and chair of medicine at Upstate, and her specialty is echocardiography and cardiac imaging with a special interest in cardiac amyloidosis. Welcome to The Informed Patient, Dr. Taub. Thank you, Ember. I'm delighted to join you today, and I'm excited to talk about cardiac amyloidosis. Well, let's start with a description of what cardiac amyloidosis is. Well, first off, let's talk about amyloidosis. It is a systemic disease affecting many organs in the body, such as the heart, kidney, lungs, joints, uh, and the brain. Um, uh, talking a little bit about the history, uh, I, I found this really fascinating. Dr. Rudolf Virchow uh, in 1854, so that's about 170 years ago, uh, introduced the term amyloid to describe a peculiar staining on brain tissue. He believed that what he saw must be starch. As it turned out, it was not starch. It was misfolded protein. So what does it mean by misfolded protein? Think about a Swiss army knife. When it's nicely folded, it's harmless. However, when it is misfolded, some sharp edges are sticking out. When depositing in tissues in the body, misfolded Swiss army knife becomes toxic and damaging to the entire system. So I just first talk about the amyloid per se, but let's focus on cardiac amyloidosis. Well, let me ask you, you use the term misfolded. What causes the proteins to be misfolded? Um, there, there are many reasons. It depends on the reasons for amyloidosis. That goes back to um, describing different forms of amyloidosis. One is uh, misfolded protein transtheratin amyloidosis. People call it ATTR amyloidosis. And, and the, uh, the protein is made from liver. And the connection between these protein units can become unstable. Therefore, they can be misfolded. And another form is from plasma cell, which makes immunoglobulin light chain amyloid. We call it AL amyloidosis. And that, that immunoglobulin can clump together, uh, leading to the misfolding. So these are the two bigger picture of precursor proteins. But among the transtheratin uh, protein misfolding, there are two other reasons. To answer your question, one is because of aging. When we age, these proteins can become more prone to misfolding. Another is hereditary, you know, familial, uh, you know, uh, TTR uh, protein misfolding. We can talk a little more on that later. So this is an inheritable disease or does it ever just develop on its own without a past history in the family? Oh, you know, there are, there are wild type, meaning that without family history, as you age, you might develop misfolding of the protein. But a, a, a number of mutations can be transmitted through family tree and causing these hereditary uh, misfolding of the protein. And so far, there are more than 140 genetic mutations have been identified that may contribute to the misfolding of the protein. In the genetic mutations, I, I think it's important to mention that one of the mutations, uh, V122I, uh, you don't have to know exactly what it means, but there is a substitution of valine by isoleucine. These forms of mutation were found in 4% of African-American population in the U.S., so we need to identify these mutations and, and make early diagnosis of vulnerable population that may develop cardiac amyloidosis. How common is cardiac amyloidosis compared with other heart diseases? Yeah, that, that, that is an intriguing question. 
uh, 20 years ago, I became aware of cardiac amyloidosis and it was called a zebra. You know, it was considered very uncommon. And now when you look around, they are horses. If you see them, you know, you have to be aware uh, they exist. So, so let me give you some numbers. So the ATTR, cardiac amyloidosis, was found in up to 16% of patients who need aortic valve surgery for aortic stenosis. And these patients are from 80 to 84 years of age. So as you age, as you survive to your golden age, there are a lot of patients who might be affected by cardiac amyloidosis. And in addition, you know, heart failure is a huge problem in the U.S. health system, affects many, many patients. And in older patients, older than 82 years of age, 13% of these individuals who suffer from heart failure with normal ejection fraction are found to have cardiac amyloidosis. And, you know, what does it mean, a heart failure with normal ejection fraction? The heart weighs well, you know, normal ejection, normal squeeze, but they can't relax because the amyloid fibrils deposit in the heart, making the environment too crowded to relax. So when patients have symptoms of heart failure, and when you take an echocardiogram, your doctor says, okay, the heart squeezes well, but what's the reason to cause heart failure? Consider cardiac amyloidosis. Before, in the past, we didn't really have the awareness, so we didn't do the screening. Another evidence I can tell you, Amber, in uh, several post-mortem studies, patients died and their heart were looked at. It was noted that you know, 25% of these older individuals have amyloid buildup in their heart. So, so all these data suggest in the aging population, in the current era, we are dealing with uh, patients who might be affected by cardiac amyloidosis. We just need to have awareness. We need to diagnose them and hopefully uh, treat them early before they go down to end stage heart failure realm. Other than age, are there factors that would increase someone's risk for developing this? Or will age in genetics? Right, correct. So it's aging and your genetics that are two major risk factors. Of course, there, there are malignant hematologic light chain amyloidosis that patients usually develop these malignant disease early on at a younger age. And this needs to be treated also early um, by the oncologist and hematologist. This is Upstate's The Informed Patient podcast. I'm your host, Amber Smith, talking with Dr. Cynthia Tao. She's a cardiologist and professor and chair of medicine at Upstate, and we're talking about cardiac amyloidosis. Let's talk about how this is usually detected. You described, it sounds like some people have this but don't know it, and it's just discovered incidentally when they have other medical procedures. Are there symptoms that someone might have that would bring them to the doctor and this would be discovered that way? Yeah. So, you know, these patients with amyloidosis tend to have very nonspecific symptoms. They might have fatigue, weakness, shortness of breath who don't have fatigue, right? And they used to, to have a high blood pressure. And later on, they notice they don't need to take blood pressure medications and they might develop orthopedic problems, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, spinal stenosis, numbness, pins of needles of their foot and fingers, sensation, you know, those uh, polyneuropathy that we describe. These patients tend to see at least five specialists trying to figure out the mystery and then once you see the right doctor who has the awareness that they were able to put together uh, the diagnosis and the delay of diagnosis can be very long, five to 10 years. Again, awareness is important and the symptoms can be quite nonspecific. So do physicians, primary care doctors, do they refer patients to Upstate's Cardiac Amyloidosis Clinic to get diagnosed or do they get diagnosed and then they get sent to the clinic? I have to say, when I first arrived here, I noticed that there was really no good pathways 
for physicians to refer uh, our patients to make diagnosis. And uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Mary McGrath from uh, a nuclear medicine department who spearheaded the PYP scan. That's a nuclear scan that can pick up signals in the heart that's been infiltrated by amyloid fibrils. And this service is the first for the city of Syracuse. And patient doesn't have to travel uh, to Rochester to get the diagnostic testings done. So this is a progress I envision in the next few years upstate will become a center of excellence for the diagnosis and treatment of cardiac amyloidosis. Currently, it takes astute primary care physician, orthopedic surgeons, and hematologists to refer patients to cardiologists for the diagnosis and potentially treatment of uh, cardiac amyloidosis. We're far from perfect. We're still trying to make sure our pathway is being worked, worked out. The goal is to provide the best patient care possible for early diagnosis. Well, let's talk about treatments. What treatments are available? The number one thing is treatment of heart failure. That's very important. Heart failure management, decongestion by diuretics beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, SGLT2 inhibitor. People have heard uh, some new kids on the block, Jardians, um, and manage atrial fibrillation uh, by uh, blood thinners, by beta blocker, by ablation sometimes. And the new medication that employ advanced biotech technology uh, are transferatin stabilizers. An example is a famidus. That medication can reduce patients' heart failure hospitalization and improve survival. And there are other medications such as silencers, a CRISPR technology facilitated medication that can help our familial amyloidosis patients to manage their neuropathy. So these are all exciting new medications uh, on the horizon that, that we look forward to prescribing them to our patients and help their symptoms. Do any of these new treatments or medications, do they work on the protein that is misfolded that is at kind of the root of all of this? Or are there any treatments that can reverse the damage? Very good question. Um, right now, these medications were used to slow the progression of disease. We don't really have enough data to say that we can reverse disease. Of course, if you make the diagnosis early, you know, you're hoping that the damage is not done yet, we can reverse disease. You know, this is something that I would love to think about. I was at, at Dartmouth and we had a very thoughtful hand surgeon who performed um, carpal tunnel release surgery. And we form a team, a multidisciplinary team, where every time he had a suspicion of amyloidosis, where patients have bilateral couple tunnel syndrome, spinal stenosis, uh, men older than 50, women older than 60, and they come to his operating room and he will take a little biopsy. And if there is amyloid deposition on the biopsy, he would refer these patients to me, okay? So 25% of these biopsies were found to have positive amyloid deposition. And several of these patients don't even have cardiac involvement. So most of these patients, when they get referred to me, they already have evidence of cardiac involvement. But some of them did not have cardiac involvement. What does it mean? We're capturing these patients early. They have amyloid deposition in their tendon, in their bones, but they haven't reached the point it will affect the heart. So can we, you know, use our treatment early to stop the deposition of these amyloid fibrils to the heart? You know, can we do that? Right now, FDA has not approved this indication, but we're hopeful with clinical trials with research, we're able to answer your question, Amber. Well, with the treatments that are available now, if you're able to slow the progression for someone, have you seen that help people? Do their symptoms get better? 
Oh, absolutely. That's why FDA approved the medication Tefamidus. They've tested this medication in patients with symptoms. You have to have symptoms before you can start the medication. Uh, and after six months, these patients feel much better and there's fewer hospitalizations for heart failure and these patients live longer. Um, you know, years ago when I learned about cardiac amyloidosis, once you have the diagnosis, your survival is six months. And now, you know, people live five years after diagnosis or even longer. Let's talk about the overall outlook for people with this condition. What is daily life like for them or how might it be interrupted? Well, like everything else, you get their symptoms. Your activities are going to be somewhat limited. You might experience exercise intolerance when you climb up a flight of stairs. You might get winded easily. And some of uh, the patients will develop atrial fibrillation when they walk. They might feel a uh, little palpitation. So these are the symptoms related to heart failure. And despite the fact they have uh, symptoms of heart failure, they need to take their medications and they need to exercise. It doesn't mean that you should just sit around on the couch. You need to, you need to walk. You need to go outside and, and pay attention to your nutrition. You know, not to uh, consume too much salt in your diet and just a heart healthy diet as per Heart Failure Society's guideline. Uh, in the management of patients with these symptoms. And in particular, for cardiac amyloidosis, drinking green tea in clinical trials might help. And like many other reasons for heart failure, management, emotional, psychological, spiritual support is equally important. Well, we talked a little about some of the therapies. Are there others on the horizon that you know about that are showing promise that are in development maybe in the lab still? Yeah. So medications to stabilize these misfolded proteins, medications to silence these misfolded proteins. And, you know, there is one medication, diflunazole, um, you know, has been utilized for neuropathy, for the numbness, tingling of the fingers and toes. Uh, so research is quite intensive in this area. This is a rare disease research that the government is supporting. And yet, you know, from zebra to horse, and actually these research are helping many, many patients. Well, I appreciate you making time to tell us about it, Dr. Tao. Oh, it's my pleasure. There's so much I would like to share with you. This is a, such an exciting field for cardiology and many, many other subspecialists are join, joining force <clears throat> and we're excited. In the spring, we're hoping to have a multidisciplinary amyloidosis symposium to describe the science, describe our trials, and hopefully the community will join us. We also welcome patients to be part of the exciting endeavor. My guest has been cardiologist Cynthia Taub. She's a professor and chair of medicine at Upstate, where she leads the Cardiac Amyloidosis Clinic. The Informed Patient is a podcast covering health, science, and medicine, brought to you by Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, and produced by Jim Howe. Find our archive of previous episodes at upstate.edu slash inform. If you enjoyed this episode, please tell a friend to listen too. And you can rate and review the Informed Patient podcast on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or wherever you tune in. This is your host, Amber Smith, thanking you for listening.